Hi guys. Today I want to talk about some software I've been dabbling with over the past couple of weeks to see if I can bring a full-blown industrial quality SCADA system to the Raspberry Pi 2. And today I'm going to give you a short presentation on where I'm up to, what needs to be done, and hopefully canvas your thoughts so that uh, we can decide if it's any reasons to keep moving forward. So to put the whole thing in context, today I'm going to talk about an introduction to the product and its history, um, talk about where the previous system sat and what we're leveraging from that, um, software architecture of the system, the product capabilities, um, where we're up to on the uh, Raspberry Pi 2 currently, and I'll do a demonstration of that online. And we then go into what needs to be done to bring it into a full-fledged industrial SCADA, um, which is mainly centered around new MMI options. Um, I'll discuss what, what applications the product can actually be um, tailored to and things we need to take seriously to make sure we deliver a, a, a working viable product. And then I'll, I'll wrap up with conclusions. So there aren't too many slides. I intend to spend most of the time actually uh, doing the demonstration but I need to talk about this stuff in order to put the thing in context. So, a few years ago, I ran a company with two friends, and that company produced software for data acquisition and control. Some people called it DCS, some people called it PCDMA, some people called it SCADA, depend what, what industry you're in. The software product itself had 40 years of man effort put into it, and it was a world-class product. It was sold to blue chip companies, I'll name a few later. And it competed against the likes of Foxborough, Honeywell, ABB, Fisher Porter, Siemens, etc. And in all uh, comparisons by independent consultants, it came out tops. The original product ran on the Motorola 68020 series of uh, computers, CPUs, and it was written under MicroWare OS 9. 85% of that was written in Kernigan and Ritchie C. The rest of it was written in ASM 68K Motorola Assembler. It used a product uh, for the graphic front end called ABB Tessellator, which came to the end of its useful life. And so the product was rewritten and ported under Nix, in other words, different variants of Unix. It originally was run on Deck Alpha and SunSpark workstations. Um, mainly driven by uh, consumer requests. And it, this time it was written 100% in C and was fully POSIX compliant. So what should it run on now? Well, I've already got it running largely on the Raspberry Pi 2, the Banana Pi and Banana Pro, and some Intel uh, x86 computers um, running Ubuntu 14.04, and that includes embedded processors such as the DMNP Vortex series. And in the future, there's no reason why it shouldn't run on the new chip computer, which is all the rage on Kickstarter now, a $9 Unix computer. So in, in theory, we could have an industrial grade SCADA system running on a $9 computer. What else should it run on? It should also run on OS X, the uh, Apple operating system, since it's fully POSIX compliant. It should run on QNX, uh, which is now owned by BlackBerry. And it should run on uh, different mobile devices, such as Apple, uh, iPad, and the iPhone. And interestingly enough, it might also run on the Apple TV, if rumors are correct, and Apple issue a software developer's kit for the Apple PC, so that people can develop products for their home connect uh, project. So the original operating system was OS 9, as I said, and if we look at the configuration, everything ran on a single board computer or VME system. It drove ABB Tessellator graphic systems, which could have up to four screens, only three shown here, and it can communicated with different industrial programmable logical controllers or instruments. The unit could actually drive 10 tessellators, so it could drive 40 screens, and it could acquire data on 25 data acquisition links, all with different protocols and having multiple nodes per link. So in theory, we could talk to 250 connected devices. 
as I said, it was later moved to Nix, and for that we chose a product called Sami, um, currently manufactured by Kinesics for the man-machine interface. And again, this was largely dictated by uh, customers. So the, the idea was that this would run on a workstation, Spark or Deck Alpha. But again, we would still talk to different industrial PLCs and we could add, add more screens simply by adding more workstations running SAMI. Um, in theory, that product should still run today, although I've, I've not put any effort into getting SAMI working with the Raspberry Pi 2. So how will the Raspberry Pi 2 look? Well, of course, we need a Raspberry Pi um, plus the software. We'll need a programmable logical controller. This one shown here is from Comfile, a thing called Cubelock. Very, very cheap, around about $30. And we talked to that over RS-232 using Modbus RTU. And of course, we'll need a screen connected to the HDMI port to do the configuration. And basically, that's all you're going to need to get a complete SCADA system up and running on a Raspberry Pi 2. So how does the hardware, uh, sorry, the software look? The software was specifically designed as a SCADA system. It's not uh, pulled together from different components around the web, such as real-time data, uh, sorry, relational databases. It had its own real-time database we, we built ourselves, and everything went through that database. So, for example, if you wanted to do uh, calculations, you would actually pull data out of the database, do your calculation, and put the result back in. In the same way, if you want to do data acquisition, we have a standardized data acquisition interface where we write different drivers, such as Modbus, etc. Data comes in, is passed into the database, we do what we need to, and if we want to send outputs to the controllers, again, it goes through the standard data acquisition interface. We did our own real-time logging system, which is far faster and far more efficient than using relational database logs. And we built our own alarm and event handling system um, which again is very comprehensive and doesn't just pass simple values. It gives you all, all kinds of things like date, time, process group, alarm priority, etc., etc. But the other interesting thing is that we had a customer applications interface where customers could actually write their own applications by using an API to the database, which meant that virtually any custom built system could be made. This architecture is consistent throughout all the different uh, product ranges, all the way from the beginning, all the way to the new one on the Raspberry Pi 2. So the product capabilities originally were that it handled 65 database objects. In other words, 65 uh, values either coming from the field or as a real result of calculations. Uh, some people call those tags. So, um, and they were acquired from up to 25 data acquisition links with multiple protocols and different numbers of nodes on the link. We could drive up to 40 VDU screens. We could log up to 10,000 of objects in the database at frequencies from anything from uh, cyclic frequencies of one second up to one year. We could do un unlimited calculations. We could have an unlimited number of displays in the system. Very comprehensive alarm and event handling package the ability to integrate customer applications, and of course, the system was self-documenting and also came with a complete suite of maintenance uh, facilities to be able to um, build your applications. All of this, irrespective of the size of the system, was expected to run with an update speed of one second. So one of the biggest projects we did was a steel mill uh, British, British Steel Ravenscraig, we had 23 uh, VDUs on there, about 400 values per screen, and the whole system updated in less than a second. So what made me think that we could actually put it onto a Raspberry Pi? Well, actually, if you look at the stats, it's pretty much a no-brainer. The original system ran on a Motorola 68030, 25, 40, or 50 megahertz. It was a 32-bit CISC computer with a separate FPU and MMU. And if you look at the web, you, you'll see different um, performance figures. I've just taken an average. It said it was running at something like 18 MIPS. By comparison, the Raspberry Pi, a dual core, 900 megahertz, 32-bit CPU with integrated FPU, 
And again, if you look on the on the web, um, there's a range of figures quoted, but just over a thousand MIPS, which means that the indicative performance difference is something like 65 times more powerful on the Raspberry Pi. In the old days, we were working on four megabytes of RAM. Um, now the Raspberry Pi has one gigabyte of RAM. Admittedly, some of this is shared with the GPU, uh, but nevertheless, we've got plenty of RAM, typically 250 times the amount that we were using in the original days. Again, in the old days, we were using SCSI hard drives, 250 megabyte capacity. That's not a, an error, that is megabytes. With a transfer rate of 20 megabytes per second, the one I'm going to show you today is running on a 16 gigabyte micro SD with a transfer rate of 95 megabits per second. Um, so therefore, we've got on the Raspberry Pi 64 times the capacity and four times the speed. And of course, we had no GPU on, on the boards in the early days. Um, we do now. We've got a, a, a dual core um, Broadcom 4 running at 250 megahertz. So in all respects, the Raspberry Pi should be up to the job, and I'm going to show you in a minute that it actually is. One thing that the Raspberry Pi doesn't have that we had in the old days was a, a, a richer assortment of peripherals. For example, we could put as many serial ports on the Motorola as we wanted. Today, we're rather limited on what we can get out of the GPIO or what we can convert from the USB ports that are available. So now let's have a quick uh, look at what is running on the Raspberry Pi currently before I go into the demo. We've got the full database suite ported over with the full 65,000 object capability. All of the data acquisition subsystem works, so we could in theory have 25 links. The logging works fully, so we can log 10,000 objects. Calculations works fully, alarm event handling fully, customer applications fully, system and documentation and maintenance is fully working. Although I'll, I'll put a caveat on the maintenance, it needs to be upgraded in terms of the look and feel. So what, what do we need to do? We need to modernize the maintenance, particularly the maintenance panels. You'll see in a minute it uses Motif. We need to get rid of that and use GTK Plus instead for a consistent look and feel across the whole um, platform. We need to add more drivers. A lot of the drivers we got in the system are legacy drivers no longer in use. So we need to add modern drivers such as Zigbee Pro, a PLC, COSEM, DLMS, which is already under development, as is CAN. And we may consider putting in things like DNP3 and uh, 61850, maybe. But the biggest, biggest thing we need to do is we need to develop a low-cost, high-performance MMI. And we got some thoughts on that to show you exactly what we're thinking of doing. So let's have a brief demo. I've actually got a Raspberry Pi running now. Um, it's running in the background. And um, if you're familiar with this stuff, I'm, I'm running VNC. And you can see it's a standard Pi running all the usual stuff. Um, I've added a few things like DIA, a, 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 a diagramming package. And I've put some additional libraries in. But apart from that, it's a standard Pi. Um, so if we open up a terminal, and we look at um, to open the terminal, and we look at um, the amount of memory we've got free. The Pi is actually pretty good on its memory usage. We can see that we've got a total of 927 megabytes, and we've got 642 megabytes free. So let's start up the SCADA system now. And we're going to run that as a background process. Uh, it'll take around about five seconds for the whole thing to load. And I can check its uh, progress by looking at a, a log. So you can see the things that are actually starting. And it's actually started now. And again, if we go back to the free, you can see before we actually had See, we had 642 free before, and as a result of starting it, we now got 639 free. So basically, we're only using four megabytes of memory for the complete SCADA system. So it's very efficient, very compact. So what I want to do is show you some of the things um, that you, you're going to want to do. And of course, the first thing you're going to want to do is uh, build your application. So we can go into a thing called Lynx Maintenance. Um, and we'll get a pop-up screen 
that shows us various things we can do within the system. So the first thing you might want to do is look at uh, your current links configuration, uh, in which case you look at whether alarm events are activated, uh, how they're all set up, whether you're using printing or not, how the events are set up. If I go to um, these different buttons, toggle buttons, hit, click that, you can see system log is activated. So I can now log everything to disk regarding what the uh, system is doing and what the operator's doing, etc. So that's the first thing I might want to set up. Uh, the next thing I might want to do is go to set up serial ports. Um, we can set up to um, 128 serial ports on the system and they can be configured to be data acquisition ports or printer ports or whatever else you want. We can set the board rate, parity, number of stop bits, data bits, etc. And to change something, you simply go onto it and edit it. Excuse me. I, I, I hit um, exit there, not edit. You go onto it and hit edit and you can get all the different um, parameters, you can tell it what kind of um, port it is, you can tell it what kind of data acquisition it's using, etc. And you can give it a logical number. Okay. So this time I do want to exit. Um, and you can see you can do various things within the system from the tools menu. If you've got problems with the files, for example, the historical logging files, you can fix those using some uh, tools that we actually provide. Next thing is that you might want to set up things like your data acquisition links themselves. So you choose a link and you need to edit that. So you can give it a name. You can choose what protocol is actually going to be on, on the link. Anybody that knows about the traditional SCADA will know that here are a number of legacy protocols. For example, GCGM80, not used very much anymore. But we do have things like Modbus TCP and also Modbus RTU. Um, and there are new protocols coming along. So you choose your protocol, you choose a cycle time, you give it a, an external ID, etc. And you can set various other parameters to tell you when things have happened. Again, I'm not going to do that because I don't have a data ac acquisition link in the system. So when we've done that, um, we then might want to go to the database and basically start populating the database with uh, some signals. So let, let's actually do that now on the, on the fly. If I go to analog objects, for example, I get two parts to the screen. One is a part that is the general description and must be filled in for all objects. And then you've got different attributes that need to be filled in depending on what this is going to do. If I've already got uh, a value in the database, I can actually retrieve it and get its previous definition. And of course, I can modify it. And I can do that online without um, recompiling or doing any software. So this one called sign was actually a calculated value. And if I go to the calculated formula, it simply takes radians and multiplies the radians by sign. OK, very simple. So let's create one. Let's go to analog objects and create a new one. And we're going to call it temp. Oh, no, we'll call it demo. Temp. OK, we give it a name. And we tell it what kind it is, analog input or output. We'll leave it as an input. Um, we can put it into different process groups if we want. I'll talk more about those in a minute. We Define its data shape, how it's going to be stored in the database. We can give it engineering units. For example, well, um, we don't have the unit. We'll call it bar, but I could put degrees C in if I wanted to. Um, we could put a range, let's say 0 to 100. Okay, So that defines the basic element. And I say I want it to be calculated. Um, so now I specify the formula. And I can specify either constants or uh, database values. And I'll use the old value called sign. And I'll actually use a constant called 3. Well, called 3, obviously. And I'll just specify the formula. So it's A times B times B. And whenever the calculation runs, the result will be put into the value of uh, demo temp. So that's done. Go back to the original. Save that. And now, of course, 
I want to um, go to the calculation list and I want to actually make sure that that value gets calculated. I've got 50 lists in the system. Some are data acquisition triggered, some are just cycled within the system. Within the validation list that's cycled, I have a the value called sign. So I'm going to put this value into the same list. So first I've got to stop the list. It's now inactive and now I can edit the uh, the list. Okay. Sorry, I can change the objects in the list. Here if we look, we've got the value called sign. And what I want to do is put this value after that because I want sign to be calculated first. So it will calculate these values in order. I want sign calculated first. And then I want to insert an object after that. And we're going to call it demo temp. There it is done. OK. Sorry. Frequency will make it OK. Make it 1. OK. Um, as you can see, it checks everything you do, and you can, it's very hard to make mistakes. You can see it's been inserted after sign. I'm OK with that now. And basically, um, that is in the list. I've just got to restart the list again. And now, every time the list cycles, it will calculate uh, demo temp for me after it's calculated sign. To show that's true, let's go back into the database and have a look at uh, the database view. Here, I can actually look at what the database values are doing in real time. So sign was 1. And you can see it's uh, calculating between minus 1 and 1. And here, if I put in demo temp, you can see that it's roughly three times the value of sign. And I've just, I've just created that and made that happen now. So. If I want to um, look at what other values I've got in the database, I can list them. And you can see I've got roughly 4,000 values in the database. And as if you remember, the database was uh, not taking up that much. In fact, I can actually show you how much it's taking. If I um, go to my terminal again, if I quit the maintenance, get my prompt back. It actually shows me what's been loaded uh, when the system was starting. And if I look at the database, you can see the database is less than a megabyte. So for 4,000 objects, I'm only taking a megabyte, which means that for the full 65,000 objects, I shouldn't be taking more than 15 megabytes, um, well within the capability of the Pi. So the one thing you may have noticed is that, um, again, if we go to the maintenance, um, system is still running, so I simply go back into Maint. You can see that the panels are old. They're actually built under uh, a window manager called Motif. And one thing I want to do is I want to actually um, modernize those and make the look and feel consistent across the whole um, across the whole system. So I want to get rid of Motif and use GTK. If you look at the old one. You can see the Motif version, and if you look at the new one, GTK version, it's a lot cleaner, and we've got pull-down menus um, rather than, for example, going to analog objects, pulling up a, an old Motif screen. You can see this is the old one in the background. Get rid of that a second. Um, doesn't look very pretty. The new one is a lot better. Um, with toggle boxes, more modern, different tabs, um, tick boxes, you know, that, that have this consistent look and feel. So there's work to be done on that side. Nothing, no rocket science, and anybody that knows about GK, GTK should have that done in a, a week or so. Um, but the other thing that you may have noticed is that I've sort of shied away from the, um, the actual man-machine interface. Now, I've been working a little bit on that. Um, Screaming Power is an expert in devel developing mobile interfaces on, on handheld devices. And one um, solution would be to put the data onto things like the iPad or the BlackBerry. Um, and we probably will do that. But we also need a dedicated man machine interface directly connected. And I'll come back to why in a minute. So if we go back into links and we look at the maintenance menu.
you can see that we can look at things like the alarm list um, and the event list. But these are not actually mimics. Um, they're just displays created in normal motif windows. What we need to do is to be able to uh, create a mimic of our process. So for example, here I'm using a product called Dyer, which is open source. And I can use this to create my static part of the background. So I can use all the things like shapes and connection points, etc., just like you do in Visio. And we've started to create sheets whereby we can actually position dynamic objects on top of that background. And for example, if I create a dynamic field, I can change its properties just like I would in Dyer. So let's say I want to make it red, apply. Um, you can see it behind. Uh, I might want to make it bigger, um, make it 40 point, for example. Apply to that. Or I might want to make it bold. Um, apply. I, ca I can create the actual parameters for the field, but as you notice, it's undefined. It's not create. It's not actually linked to the database at the moment. And I do that simply by um, typing in a database reference. And if you remember, I created this value called demo temp. And now, if I apply, you can see it's picking that value up straight out of the database. And of course, if I want to put a text on there to say what it is. Um, I can do that in Dyer. Degree C, for example. Oops. Um, we'll do the same. Make it visible. Make it blue. Make it bold. Size is OK. OK. And I simply position that where I want it behind. So we're working on a, a dynamic editor. Um, we'll have things in there like thermometers and trends and stuff, but it's early days at the moment. Um, and we're not limited to traditional utility type SCADA diagrams. If I come out of this, I won't bother saving it. Um, we can do the same by creating our own stuff. So let's say that we're going to go for, um, we're going to go for home automation application. We can actually put a floor plan of our house in there. And we can say, OK, there's my floor plan. And I want the actual temperature in a bedroom. Same sort of ideas. Properties. Yeah, we'll make it. Um, orange this time, make it 30, make it bold, apply, wrong color, more colors, pick that one, okay, apply, and again if we link it to the database, We can get our temperature anywhere we like on the diagram, showing what the value of the temp in the room is. So you're getting the idea of uh, basically um, where we're going with the graphics, but there is a lot more work to be done. So let me quit out of this now and go back to the presentation and just finish off very quickly. Um, what needs to be done, if you remember, uh, we basically need to optimize the hardware. Basically, uh, we've got um, a limited capability on the Pi. We need additional functionality, such as real-time clock, more serial ports, etc. That work can be done quite easily. Uh, we need to modernize the interface to use Motif, uh, to get rid of Motif, sorry, and use GTK. We need to produce new drivers. Some are under development already. Um, but the big thing is we need to modernize the MMI. And after we've done all that, we may want to bring it to market and derive new products. So what are the MMI options? We've got two to be considered. The first is mobile uh, delay delivery of data, going to people's handheld devices. Screaming Power is an expert in this field, and we can uh, bring that data to mobile devices quite easily. People expect that. They've been using the technique for a long time. 
but it's not considered secure enough for industrial applications. It's okay for pushing data so you can monitor something, but it's not good enough for control. So we need the dedicated displays. And these are more acceptable for an industrial environment. They're easier to build in security. They can deliver data in a more timely manner. And there's more real estate, so you can display more data. The timely provision of data is imperative for both uh, sides of the application, either mobile or dedicated. Um, you need a knowledge of what's happening now. It's no good if it's five minutes out of date. It gives you better making decision capability. It's an enhanced user experience. Um, all right, so finally, what are the applications that we can actually put on um, this platform? As I said, it had been sold to many blue chip companies around the world. These included Hoffman LaRoche for pharmaceutical manufacture, British Steel for integrated steel plant uh, control, Florida Power and Light on a nuclear power station, the Manchester SIP Canal, the locks are all controlled by this system, Loveland Light and Power for hydro plant, power gen uh, for training simulators, etc. Um, you know, British nuclear fuels for Dungeness and Haitian power plants, nuclear power plants. So where does it fit today? Well, obviously building automation because you can bring the price right down and it fits on boards as small as the pie. That's a good fit. But it can also be uh, fitted into smart grid applications if you're a utility. And we can cover virtually everything that a smart grid has to offer, including data concentrators for advanced metering infrastructure, complete microgrid controllers, public lighting, electric vehicle charging and billing, off-grid generation, so if you've got um, uh, solar panels on your on your roof and you don't want to connect to the grid all the time, we can do the control of that. Distributed automation for substations, demand side management, etc. But it's also applicable to other utilities, so it can do wastewater and sewage treatment, river management, and if you're a telco, it could do sour ta uh, sour cell tower monitoring. And it can also be applied to any general process control application. And we have the industry expertise to help identify the solution set. But we need to take a number of things seriously as we move forward. The cost is very important. It's got to be really cheap. There's no point in putting a multi-thousand dollar software package onto a $35 pie. It's got to be easy to use. We subscribe to the uh, Steve Jobs philosophy that you should be able to give an application to a kid of 10 and he should be able to master it in a couple of hours without a manual. It should be easy to customize. It should be um, easy to work with new devices. There are a number of companies out there, particularly Apple, Google, Samsung, uh, Lucky Gold Star. Uh, these, these kind of people seem to think that if they get in there first, their solution will become a de facto standard and everybody will follow it. But there's always going to be a need to integrate legacy stuff or, or new technologies. And so interoperability for us is very important. And we also need to take cybersecurity very important, particularly if we're doing control across the internet. Data presentation uh, depends on the device that you're actually using. Mobile devices basically give simple information in the form of trends and, and uh, alerts, whereas the, uh, the dedicated screens can give you far more data. But reliability is also very important. Um, I heard at one point Hoffman LaRoche had run one of their systems at a plant in Siciln for 14 years without restarting it. So reliability is very important to us. And program uh, migration capability is also something to consider in the future. Again, we don't want to be locked into any particular vendor and we need to be able to embrace new technology. So in conclusion, we have a system that was world-class a long time ago. It's been ported to the Pi, and the software as it stands now is a rock-solid foundation to build off. It requires absolutely no programming knowledge to build your initial application. Uh, you don't need to write any code. It's simply fill in the forms. Um, there is an API to the database so people can customize the product and build their own applications. It can be applied to all projects from hobbyist to commercial. It can be used now for blind applications. In other words, if you don't want the MMI uh, and you're, using, you're doing things like um, feeding data to mobile workforce or use it, using it as, as a data concentrator or just a simple alarm event handling package, um, it's available now. Um, but for SCADA applications, uh, we need some effort to complete the MMI to turn it into the complete SCADA product. So that's basically the presentation. Thank you for viewing. I hope it's uh, provided you with some thoughts. Um, if you want any more 
uh, questions answering or you've got some comments, we'd be delighted to hear them. And you can send them to want to know, skater at screamingpower.com. And if you want to look at a sister video, I did one on how data moves through utility and where this product could fit. Go to YouTube and search for managing utility data and you'll come up with a similar video and it shows you uh, how this could be turned into a data concentrator and where it would apply. So thanks very much for your time for watching. Hope you found it interesting and we look forward to your comments. See you next time.